Welcome to the Sputnik, with me, the Prince of Wales. I think it's an extremely interesting thing. The whole aspect of, uh, of Soviet space travel has always fascinated me, ever since I was at Gordonston. Of course, I, I couldn't admit that they had a crush on Valentina Tereshkova. Otherwise, my housemaster would have thought I was some kind of commie and given me a terrible thrashing. So that's why I, I'm so pleased to come out, as it were, and present Sputnik now. Sorry, Your Royal Highness, but I got here first. I'm Neil Clark, orbiting the world on Sputnik for my good friends George and Gatry. Have Donald Trump and Twitter been a marriage made in heaven or in hell? The American president has used social media to cut out the middlemen in the mainstream media and appeal directly to the voting public. Since launching on Twitter in 2011, the president has tweeted over 34,000 times and has an incredible 29.5 million followers. That's even more than we have following Sputnik. What part did tw Twitter play in propelling Trump to the presidency? And what can we learn about the Donald from his 140 characters? To help us answer these questions is the award-winning and highly respected journalist Peter Oborn, the co-author of a new book, How Trump Thinks, His Tweets and the Birth of a New Political Language an annotated chronology and analysis of all the president's tweets. Peter, a very warm welcome on board the Sputnik. What we've got to ask you, first of all, is that Trump is not the only pol leading politician who uses Twitter. Just about every leading politician mm. today uses it. What makes his tweets so different from the tweets of, say, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, John McCain, etc.? Yeah, the answer is... Uh, Hillary Clinton's tweets were, were created by committee. Right. Uh, all these political desiccated calculating machines, uh, special advisors, right. would nerdishly sit around yeah. and sort of... One occasion, they took nine hours to put out a tweet. Put out one tweet, nine yeah. hours. Yeah, nine world... hours of committee meetings. Must be a world record, probably. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah. and so they're, they're all calculated and they're, mm. all, and they're all rather dispiriting and they're all dead. Mm. What, the the Donald, Donald Trump, for all of his other failings, they're, they're spontaneous, they're alive. Mm. He, he just whacks them out there on his fat fingers in front of the telly wearing his dressing gown, you know, and, and, they, and they comb they're combustible, they're dangerous, they take mm. risks, mm. Uh, they engage with people, they're exciting. And would he have got to the White House without Twitter, do you think? Um, no. He himself says that Twitter took him to the mm. White House, uh, and there's every reason to think so, because... His White House strategy was based on uh, confronting, not not uh, f forming alliances and and sucking up to the the uh, our beloved friends in the mainstream media, <laughs> of which you are, don't apparently belong yourself. Yeah, I'm disappointed <laughs> to say. Um, uh, I'd say he, he was of silent, of, of going around their backs, uh, mm. of finding other methods of talking to people, and the primary method were these uh, these tweets, which he, he uh, which he sent out. And, and I, I think, in many ways, they're quite close to genius. Uh, and what 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 were the best and the worst of Donald Trump's tweets that you found? Yeah. It's very interesting. The early tweets are ghastly, really. They're, they, they, he takes, he does it. He's advised, obviously, by some uh, some snake oil salesman that he ought to uh, tweet in order to sell his horrible products. Yeah. In those uh, days, it was his TV show, wasn't it? The it, Apprentice. Was that was that right? He had a that? TV show, The Apprentice. His various brands. He yeah. tweeted out about his men's wear, his ghastly books, telling you how to make lots of money. And, yeah. I mean. Uh, um, his wife uh, has all kinds of perfumes, and I mean, it, it's all tweeted about, and it's all dead because it's clearly done yeah. by the, uh, the the marketing men. But there is a moment, in, uh, and you can see it very clearly in the summer uh, of 2011, mm. when some uh, 
uh, you know, it's a bit like uh, that moment in The Terminator mm. where, where the machines take control. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's a kind of incredible moment where the tweets come alive. Right. And yeah. um, they uh, and Trump discovers his inner voice and the, and the 140 characters are the ideal, ideal thing for Trump. You know, the wake up America, China is eating your lunch. Yes, that was a classic, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Uh, uh, and, they, and, and he does, uh, and some, something about them uh, intuits into his uh, subconscious, I think. Uh, and all, it happens to all writers and all great politicians. Mm. There's a moment when you discover your voice. Mm. And he discovers his voice. And Twitter is the perfect medium because it's it's very unsophisticated. No the, nuance really there, is there, yeah. at all. Yet you can get out a powerful message, mm. only mm. the scope to get out, you know, a sense of black and white. Mm. And yet there's a lot you can do with it. And, uh, uh, and he engages with Twitter and he becomes a, a phenomenon. He just tweets. He doesn't sort of respond to people tweeting him back. Well, he does. does. He, or, or, the, or does he? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, what is it? Yeah, he will. But I mean, what he does um, is, as the 2016 election starts to get going, half of his tweets are retweets. Not of this sort of, you know, he, 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 most people watching this were familiar with the comment, you know, the commentators, the chattering classes retweeting each other and yes. it, it, reinforcing their own ghastly worldview yes. and prejudices and telling each other how wonderful they are. Right. Uh, what, <laughs> what, um, <laughs> what Trump does is retweet the punters out there in the sticks. Mm. Uh, and so half of them become... And so he engages personally, mm. very directly, with ordinary people. Lots of cases we uncovered in our book. Of, you know, a little chap, you know, a little bloke who has 250 followers, you know, he's, he's a grandmother and his yeah. second cousin and his best friend. Suddenly he's retweeted yeah. by Trump and he's got 20 million people looking at his observations. And so that's how Trump engages... That's very different, isn't it? Because, as yeah. you say, elite figures don't normally do that, do they? They just retweet each other. Oh, no, they're, 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 they're very important they're people. Non, non people for the they're market. very important. These yes. people in the mainstream, they're very important yes. people. Yes. Very serious people. And they praise, praise each One of the reasons we know that is they tell each other how, how good. very important they are, yes. Yeah, 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 quite. Yes. So that was a populist move by Trump, really, wasn't it? <laughs> yes. to, to embrace Twitter. Mm -hmm. And uh, what would be the sort of worst uh, Donald Trump tweet that you saw? One with a really sort of objectionable. And what would be the best? What, what, I mean, some of his tweets on the Arab Spring have proved to be yeah. pretty. Say all the good they? ones. Yeah. He got, he understood the, um, the dy dynamics of Western intervention in, in, in the Middle East much more clearly than his opponents. He mm. warned immediately. Mm. Uh, and by the, by the early autumn of 2011, he was predicting mm. what chaos would ensue from the Libyan intervention. Right. He got that completely right. Likewise, uh, he was warning against interventions in Syria. He later changed his mind. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, <laughs> but he was warning against interventions in Syria. He was warning against Iraq, Afghanistan. He's very, very uh, coherent and consistent um, in his... Um, you know, it's, it's not an idealistic foreign policy. It's an isolationist foreign policy, mm. really. But it, also, he does appear... Um, reading his tweets the, to understand the dynamics of what was going to go wrong, it was you know it was strongly against the Libyan things, right? Mm. Right, right. Now the the um, there are on the other hand there are some terrible tweets. I mean, real. I mean, he, he has this horrible habit of if, if a famous person dies, he's the best friend of that. Best friend of that. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, when Nelson Mandela dies, who he possibly, I reckon, maybe met once for about three seconds. One well, handshake, three seconds. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you know, it's uh, my his wonderful relationship with Nelson. I mean, <laughs> given the kind of company which Trump keeps, um, mm. for him to claim uh, a relationship with Nelson Mandela, I find pretty gruesome, to be honest. So that was a real low point, perhaps, uh, for yeah. the 34, yeah. 34,000 tweets. And I mean, and there's a white, there's a, there's a even, I mean, more Trump, I mean, one of the, his retweets, we, we found out was, we, there's, you know, it was white, something called white genocide, really ugly, horrible mm. Nazi right. website. So there is, uh, there is that darkness to Trump. Peter, you're a man of many talents, uh, not only Britain's probably most respected political commentator, you're a great sports fan, as I am. We've mm. been racing together at the Cheltenham Festival. Certainly you're also a very big uh, cricket fan. And you have written the authoritative history of cricket in Pakistan, haven't you? I certainly have. Wounded Tiger. Yeah. I'm very, very proud of that. Um, and actually, it's not a bad day to talk about this when the two of the greatest men of a, a whole history of Pakistan cricket, mm. um, Mizbah Haq, the great captain who mm. saved, and Yunus Khan, they, basically they saved Pakistan yeah. cricket. 
after the terrible terrorist assaults in 2009, when the Sri Lankan team, mm. Sri Lankan team was targeted, and then the match fixing or the spot fixing uh, controversy, yeah. uh, more properly said, uh, to the following year, which basically put Pakistan out into the, you know, the reason to, yeah. uh, and it's been saved by Misbah, who, well, let's pay tribute to this great man who. Uh, who saved Pakistan cricket, and that was so much, that's so important because mm. it's, it's the whole na idea of the Pakistan nation, and it's so full of these great, yeah. wonderful figures. It's an amazing book. Yeah, an amazing book. I recommend it to everyone, basically who's interested yeah. in sport. Mm. Going back to Trump briefly, I mean mm. things are moving pretty fast. Probably what we say in this program might be out of date by the time mm. it's broadcast. <laughs> you know the FBI story. I see he's been tweeting uh, this week about his sharing intelligence. Hasn't he with the Russians saying, you know, what's wrong? I did it for humanitarian reasons, mm. because apparently it was about an uh, ISIS plot to take down Russian civilian airlines. Uh, isn't that another? Uh, is, uh, we say Twitter helped Trump get to the White House. Is it? A, is it possible too that Twitter can actually make him stay in the White House because he can actually respond to his critics uh, far quicker, and more directly than if he had to go through the conduit of the a pretty hostile press. It's a very nice point, actually, it's, it, because he, he saw when he left, when he won the presidency, mm. he said he was going to stop tweeting. Mm. Uh, but actually, that never happened. But certainly the tweets became less interesting. And mm. suddenly now he's engaged in this new uh, fight mm. for survival. He's um, should have gone back, hasn't he? To, to, he's gone to, yeah. back and, and, ju and justifying himself on Twitter. Mm. And that's, of course, very um, a significant thing to do, and it's the first thing, time this has ever been done. As you, mm. as you said, you know, Barack Obama's tweets were very careful, mm. uh, and, and, and and yet uh, Trump uses them as a method of so, uh, as a method of primary method of uh, getting out his political message and bypassing the the main political media. Yes, yeah, so perhaps a, a follow-up book in a couple of years' time when he... Well, <laughs> every six months. Every be, six yeah. months, yeah. but he's getting 75,000. Peter, thanks so much for coming on The Sport, Nick. Yeah. It's been great. Don't go away, because after the break, we'll be getting the lowdown on this week's presidential elections in Iran with our own Middle East expert, Catherine Shakdam. <laughs> Welcome back to Sputnik with me, Neil Clark. With elections underway in Iran, there are a number of issues at stake. Along with the usual domestic concerns regarding economic and social agendas, Donald Trump's campaign pledge to rip up the 2016 Accord which lifted sanctions, must surely colour the outcome. Will the electorate move toward a government more in line with the Islamic Revolution, or will they stick with the more liberal agenda of the current Rouhani administration? To help us drill down to what might be going through their minds is Catherine Shaktam, our Middle East expert. Catherine, a very warm welcome back on board the Sputnik. So who are the runners and riders in the, in the Iranian election stakes, so well to speak? I would say there's two main, you know, um, I think, candidates here, and you have Said Ibrahim Raisi, um, mm. who is definitely... I, mean, I think he's a newcomer in the sense that, you know, the West wasn't very much aware of his existence until now. Mm. Uh, and then, of course, incumbent president uh, Hassan Rouhani, who mm. is running again. Um, and, and I think it's really uh, a race in between those two candidates uh, in particular. I mean, the others are there, uh, but I would say they, they're there to, um, you know, demonstrate that Iran is, in fact, you know, a pluralist um, democracy and that, you mm. know, people... You need to have different voices to kind of, um, you know, um, make room for, you know, people's, I would say, agenda and to make sure that, you know, their needs and the voices are being represented. But really, when it comes down to it, we're really talking in between a race in between Said Raisi and President Rouhani. And I think it's very interesting mm -hmm. because the, I mean, I know that the West has been leaning very heavily towards President Rouhani because, of course, he brokered, um, you know, the, the nuclear agreement. Yeah. Um, and he makes things very interesting for the West because he's very much understood as someone who is more diplomatic in his approach. Yes. But what is very interesting is that the West is completely missing the points in Iran, where there's um, almost a revival, I would say, um, that is happening right now in Iran, where this new generation, you know, the youth, um, that the West is very willing to portray as being pro-Western in that, you know, they want reform and they want mm. things to change. They do, but they don't want change in the, in the way that, I would say, Western capitals understand it. And it's very interesting because you have someone like Said Raisi who's coming to the scene and has been portrayed as a so-called hardliner, hardliner or conservative, mm. uh, because, of course, he 
represents, you know, the religious establishment in a way. Right. He's very much in tune with what the youth wants right now, which is uh, a, a return, I would say, to uh, the principles of 1979 revolution. Mm. And by that, I mean this idea that Iran and Iranians have a right to their own system of governance, regardless of what the West or other countries in the international community think of it. Mm. And that is very interesting because we live in a time where we keep talking about the separation of power, you know, that the religious needs to be cut off from the political. And fair enough, it has worked in the West. I mean, you know, some might argue that it's not working anymore. Mm. Um, but Iran understand politics and the way that its system needs to, to function very differently. Um, and they want to have this uh, religious oversight. They want to have a nation under God in the true sense of the, of the mm. word. Um, and that's what the, the new generation is actually going back towards. They understand that it has um, the governance of the juries has very much anchored their sense of nationality uh, and that they understand that it actually has saved Iran in that it has remained an independent nation. Mm. It doesn't mean they haven't suffered from economic sanctions and whatnot, of course not. Yeah. But it means that they understand that it was a necessary struggle and they understand that this is something that they want to keep pushing to towards and not, you know, what we're calling now, which is, you know, this globalist agenda where yes. everybody has to kind of blend in and come into this world yes. economy. Iran wants very much to remain independent. It doesn't mean it doesn't want to play nice with its neighbors. It mm. just means that they want to uh, preserve and protect their sovereignty, their right to political self-determination, uh, and their right to self to their own system of governance, which is different from that of the West, but democratic nevertheless. Yes. Quite. And I think that's very interesting because he represents this alliance in between what the future will look like in Iran and the tradition of Iran in terms of, uh, you know, this, this marriage in between the religious and the political. And there's a fusion here that a lot of the time the West misunderstand. Because we talk about theocracy when we mm -hmm. talk about mm -hmm. Iran. It's not a theocracy, it's, a, it's an Islamic republic. Mm -hmm. Meaning that it is a democracy, but a democracy that relies upon um, a degree, uh, you know, this religious oversight. So you have, it's very interesting the way that it functions because there is no real line in the sand that is being drawn. But at the same time, there is a very clear space where people have, um, you know, can express themselves and decide what policies they want to follow. But at the same time, it's architected in a way that it stays within the boundaries set up by Islam. The system, but it's not the it's same very as here, in a sense. Like Western exactly. democracies, right? exactly. I think when we think of our elections in the West, it's mm -hmm. very much the same thing, isn't it? Iran gets criticised for saying that you have to stay within the parameters of mm -hmm. the Islamic Republic. But isn't the same here, that anybody who wants to go outside of these narrow parameters is, is attacked and assailed and called an extremist. Absolutely, and that's doesn't interesting. Doesn't get the airtime, doesn't get any promotion at all. But isn't it interesting, mm. the, the degree of prejudice? And I think, you know, to be quite fair with you, I think um, 1979 Iran has been uh, grossly misunderstood in that they, so, they didn't understand that it was truly a stand for justice. Um, mm. and, and national sovereignty. I mean, you know, when Imam Khomeini came to the scene, uh, it, was an, it was an act of revolution against a tyranny, the Shah. Mm. Uh, and the Shah represented, of course, you know, capitalist interests. And he Western backed, of course. Exactly. Yeah. He yeah. represented imperialism in its most, you know, gross and, and despicable uh, manner, I would say. I mean, he, mm. he massacred a lot of people. We need mm. to remember this. So when Imam Khomeini came, people, of course, saw, you know, a cleric that they did not understand. They did not understand, you know, the, 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 his, his own sense of fashion or the tradition that he he carried mm. and so automatically they labeled him as being you know a hardliner a radical he wasn't radical at all what he was actually calling for mm. which is interesting uh, is actually what america is calling for which is you know empowerment of the people legitimacy democracy mm. human rights dignity sovereign mm. national you know all, all those um you know patriotism all those principles it's that o the yeah, West... it's okay for the u.s and Donald exactly. Trump to say that but not okay for iranians to say that it's yeah. interesting isn't yeah. it how you know it's it's i just i find it very compelling that you know you can have for example donald trump calling for America first but when Iran is saying it mm. when Ayatollah Khamenei is actually calling for Iran you know to kind of strap up and say you know we are Iranians and we will continue to stand for Iranian interests fair enough it mm. is their country after all then it becomes you know an act um, you know, an act You're of an extremist, war, then, aren't you, or you it's, that, yeah. it's belligerent or it's it's dangerous for for, yeah. for stability for the stability of the mm. region but how so Mm. You, you cannot possibly make a case for your own rights if you don't actually expect other people to demand the same rights and actually claim it for themselves. Mm. Uh, and I think that's the problem that we have today, is that exceptionalism is actually leading the show and that we have decided somehow along the line to say that Western democracy is automatically better 
Mm. But we tend to forget that it's not the case of better or worse, it's the case of what do the people want. It's interesting because Saudi Arabia, for example, which is a theocracy, which is violent and repressive and, and is mm. actually, I would say, quite rather despicable in the manner that it's, it, it operates, um, is never criticized because it's a front. Mm. But then again, you know, would you rather be a front with a democracy you know, maybe you, do, you don't agree with everything, but still right. democracy. Mm -hmm. Or would you actually lie in bed with a theocracy? I would choose Iran mm -hmm. as a friend rather than mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia, because at least they don't commit war crimes every day. What differences would there be in terms of foreign policy, if any, depending on who wins? For example, with the accords with the US and also in relation to Syria, because I'm sure you'll mm -hmm. agree that what happens in Syria is usually important for Iran. Were yes. the Assad government to be toppled, then this would be very dangerous for Iran, because we know we saw Wesley Clark, Commander Wesley Clark, the NATO commander's speech, talking about how many countries the US was going to take out. Iran's mm -hmm. on the list. We know that were the Syrian government to fall, then Iran would be next in the neocon line of fire. Is there any, would there be any difference at all between the candidates on the position regarding the US and Syria? I'm going to say, you're not going to have, you're not going to find a real difference in that you need to understand when it comes to Iran, um, I would say that Ayatollah Khamenei set the tone. So he already made very clear um, that you know there will be no backing from Syria because Syria asks for help, and mm. Iran understands that you know when it comes to counterterrorism, you can't really play lightly, go in and then get out when it gets tough. No. Um, so I don't think that you're going to see any real difference. You might see a difference uh, in in the manner in which the agenda is being carried, okay. uh, in that you're going to find you know um, a different of tone. Right. Uh, maybe language uh, or the behavior will be a bit different. But I would say that when it comes to um, Rouhani, Mr. Rouhani, um, he has been more liberal. I don't like the word liberal, but I would say he has been uh, a bit more pro-Western in that he's leaning towards capitalism a bit more, where there's a, a greater desire to, to be integrated into, I would say, the world economy. Mm. Now, when it comes to Sayyid Raisi, um, there's a greater desire to really temper you know, capitalism with, I would say, what Ayatollah Khamenei referred to as the resistance economy, in that he very much pushes on this idea that Iran needs to be independent. Mm. And it doesn't mean that it needs to be cut off, but it means that there's a, there's a need for a degree of self-sufficiency uh, so that Iran would be able to negotiate with a strong position, you know, whether it's, um, uh, you know, um, business deals or you know political agreement mm. or, or anything like this because if you come from a place where you are financially sound and strong mm. then you can really actually promote um the the rights of your people rather than that of yeah. the people across the table from you and are there concerns catherine in iran about what happened to libya for example mm -hmm. because it's very similar isn't it libya colonel Gaddafi was out in the cold pushed out in the cold by mm -hmm. the way he was the pariah mm -hmm. Then, about 2003, he surrendered his weapons program, sanctions were lifted, Western investment poured into Libya, it became a cruise ship destination, Tony Blair was out there grinning, and what was that all preparing us for? War on Libya, mm -hmm. to weaken Libya, to mm -hmm. get, uh, to use Western, if you like, investment in there as a sort of cover mm -hmm. for then a regime change op. Is there a sort of concern among Iranians that Rouhani's approach might possibly lead to that further along down the line and and that in other words they would be better off having a leader who was actually uh if you like less uh pro-western mm. to, to defend the country basically you see again i'm going back to um i do understand where you're coming from uh but you have to understand that the leadership the real leadership uh is within mm. the hands of ayatollah Khamenei. so i don't think that iranians are concerned because they understand that right. the country is very much protected yeah. and certain lines will never be crossed i think that you know um, mm. ayatollah Khamenei was very clear as to where he stands in terms of you know what he will allow and not allow because he's there to ensure that there is the integrity <clears throat> of the state is being right. preserved and i think this is something that the west needs to really get a grip on and understand that some things will never change because Iran speaks a tradition that the West might not understand, but it doesn't mean it's not there. Mm. Um, and, and I think he has a great degree of um, this misconception when it comes to Shia Islam because people think Islam thinks Saudi Arabia. Shia Islam is very different. Mm. Shia Islam has a whole system and a tradition which is, even though very similar in, in many ways, very different in the way that it manifests politically speaking. Mm. Uh, and I think that people just need to get a grip and try to understand it rather than pass judgment thinking they're talking about Saudi Arabia. Yeah, yeah. It's very different mm -hmm. in Iran. You can't, you know, you can't talk about, you can, Iran has a human rights 
um, mm. tradition. You know, uh, yeah. women have a right uh, in Iran mm. that they don't have in Saudi Arabia, for example. So it's really talking, um, you know, you're talking apples mm. and, and, and bananas here. Yes. Uh, you can't, there is no comparison. And we have elections in Iran. Exactly, right exactly. Yeah, which, I, I mean, in Saudi yeah. Arabia, I, I can't remember the last time they had elections. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was about 14 centuries ago or something. And, um, you know, I mean, it's a And the it's, British government doesn't joke. seem to mind too much about that, does it? Exactly, which yeah. is interesting, yes. because they criticise a lot Iran, but Iran actually has elections. Mm. And, for example, um, there were several articles now, I think it was the Middle East Eye and the Middle East yeah. Monitor, you know, talking about suddenly Iran is on the war path, you know, they're mobilising their troops. It's not true. What they're doing is that you have to understand that millions and millions of Iranians are going to vote. It's a logistic nightmare. Yeah. And what they're trying to do is actually facilitate, you know, uh, buses going from point A to point B uh, without any trouble. So what's the problem in having, you know, Know, um, the army and the, the security service in, in Iran to secure, um, you know, to ensure that everything goes up to plan and that there's no issues. Right. I think it's quite reasonable, I would say. Absolutely. Well, Catherine, it's been a pleasure to have you once again on the Sputnik. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. Always a pleasure. Well, unfortunately, that's all we've got time for today. I've been Neil Clark, standing in for George Galloway. And as George would say, it's been marvellous. <laughs>